and welcome back for our final talk uh, the and the final keynote uh, given by Daniel Gillblad. Daniel Gillblad is the head of AI research at RISE, the Swedish research institutes, and co-director of AI Innovation of Sweden. He will give his State of Sweden AI Perspectives and Strategies talk. He also gave uh, the final keynote speech at the first Gaia conference. And it will be very interesting to see how his, your views have changed since then, if, uh, if at all. Welcome. Thank you so much. Right. So thank you so much for the introduction. Yes, uh, two years ago I gave a keynote at the Gaia conference and I talked a little bit about the state of AI, uh, machine learning, what we're doing in Sweden and ways forward. So yes, I'm going to try to update that a little bit and then also connect that to work that I've been involved in for the last two or three years with developing strategies for AI in Sweden, how to get it out there, how to really build solutions together in Sweden, how to build programs for it and so on. And um, uh, as was said, yes, I work for RICE. I also do a little bit of work for Recorded Future as, as stated in the program. I'm also uh, right now uh, an associate director for KTH Digital Futures. But today I'm really going to take AI Sweden as a starting point. Because AI Sweden right now is looking at the state of AI, what is being done at companies and public sector and so on around Sweden, and trying to find out the way forward for the next five, ten years basically, so that we really can build a strong AI community in Sweden. And to do this, and in this presentation, I'm going to focus quite a lot on, let's call it, shifting perspectives. A lot of what we're doing in AI now is quite similar to what we were doing in AI five years ago and even 10 years ago and in many cases 20 or 25 years ago. But my feeling is that the way we view our work is shifting quite dramatically. But let's move back to AI Sweden and what it is. And let me give you a few minutes introduction basically. So AI Sweden was started by the Swedish government with a mission. And uh, the Swedish government looks very much on AI as we want to be the best at applying AI in the world. We realize that AI is a very, very big field. Uh, Sweden cannot be world leading in all of them, but we can be one of the best in the world to apply it all throughout society. So our mission at AI Sweden is to accelerate the use of AI for the benefit of society, for the benefit of competitiveness, and for everyone living in Sweden. Grand vision, but it's actually very, very rewarding to work from this kind of view. Work for Sweden, not uh, just a single university or company or something like that. So what are we? Well, we are a national center for applied AI. We are a neutral, non-profit, and broadly funded uh, uh, actor. So in a sense, we are a government initiative, but we're also funded and contributed to by a large range of actors. And we really want to make sure to get AI out there. These are some of the partners that we're looking at at the moment. We cannot go through all of them. They're growing really, really rapidly. By now, we're 80 to 100 partners. But it's at least very interesting to see that coming into this from all of Sweden, we have academia, we have research institutes, we have large companies like Ericsson and Volvo, Sense Act, and so on. We have uh, public sector regions all coming together and something that is so important for Sweden and to drive deep tech, and that is the startup scene. To actually bring in the startups to develop the really, really new solutions and platforms that we're going to be using for the next five or ten years. So what are we striving for? And as in many of 
research or innovation initiatives, of course we're striving for excellence. But that doesn't mean for us that we're just looking at academic excellence and just publishing papers at the best conference in Sweden. No, it means that we really want to push the boundaries when it comes to high value AI applications and getting them out there and really providing value. We want to provide excellent AI applications. We are providing and looking at leadership for Sweden, taking on a role to help people uh, work together with AI for the future. And this happens through collaboration. So we're trying to be a platform where people can do research, innovation, development, deployment, all of these things together. A few of the things that we are working with is uh, we have a strategic partner program, we have a small training program, uh, we have uh, networking uh, events and things like that, but perhaps the most interesting things uh, for this kind of audience is we're running a rather large project portfolio with uh, applications and more basic research uh, with an applied flavor uh, in our large project portfolio. And we're working to build what we call a data factory. And you can think of it as our infrastructure backbone. This place where we place our solutions, developed code, data sets that we can share, components, all of these things that we try to build within AI Sweden that we can distribute to many, basically. So this is short about AI Sweden. Now, before we go into these strategies for Sweden, what can we do now and in the future? Let's talk a little bit about where ML and AI are today and compare it to two years ago, 10 years ago, and so on. I've been working with these things for around 20 years by now. And these are things that I've been saying about machine learning and AI almost all this time. First of all, machine learning is mature and deployable. So this has something we've been saying for a very, very long time, way before the large AI hype. So it, was that true? Yes, absolutely. There was a huge amount of things we, that we could really do with machine learning that wasn't necessarily being done because it hasn't, hadn't proven itself at very large scale and at really, really, let's say, spectacular applications. But it was certainly true. There are real practical limits to its applications. So has this changed? No, not at all. There are very real practical applications, limits for ML and for AI, and they will be here for a very long time, basically. So this is not necessarily something that's changed either. And the final point that there are many components necessary to actually build real AI systems that don't focus on just one of them, that certainly has not changed. And let's go through a few of these things, basically. So if we're talking about changing perspective, it sounds a little bit like nothing has changed uh, at all, but of course they have. If we go back 10 years ago, just doing this simple kind of uh, uh, object detection and things like that in images was basically, well, it was almost impossible. It was very, very difficult. Today, we know that this is more or less a standard component that we can build upon and rely upon. And this is something that I think is extremely important for uh, the evolution of AI. We are getting more and more standardized, tried out solutions, components that we can build upon. Some things we do not need to reinvent. This goes for implementations, it goes for network structures, trained models, and so on. But we build more and more of a component library that we can build new applications on. I really, really think this is a most important way forward, basically. If you go back 20 years, what did we rely on? Well, we relied on basically the basic numerical libraries and so on, hoping that they were correct and so on. Now we're taking a step further. We're really, really more relying on good implementation of neural networks or boosting or uh, whatever you're looking at, basically. So this has really, really changed. And while we have a development of, yes, 
so many methods, so many approaches, so many publications, and so on. We are also finding good ways forward. Sometimes it feels like it would basically have been easier to get into, uh, from a personal pers perspective, getting into AI today and not having all of this legacy. Um, many times, perhaps, uh, just saying that uh, reloads and um, uh, in a neural network and using Adam for optimization, that's good enough. And this is a very standard approach. If you go back 5, 10, 15 years, we really didn't know that these were really powerful basic structures that could be reused again and again. And the choice was in a sense a little bit wider. So we're getting much, much further. It might feel like it's taking time, but it's actually really not. Things are moving very quickly right now. Something we discussed two years ago was basically, so yes, deep learning has proven itself to a degree. It really has shown it what it can do on a certain type of structured data, like images, sound, and so on, where you have a certain kind of dependency structure that typically falls, it's localized, and it falls relatively quickly. With convolutional networks and things like that, you could do a lot with these things. With uh, recurrent neural networks, you could do a lot. But uh, to really prove itself, perhaps AI need to show some really, really good result on something is slightly different with other long-term dependencies and things like that, like language. So <laughs> what's been happening during the last couple of years? Well, we can really see that machine learning has proven itself within natural language processing. Today, the biggest models that are being built, the most advanced uh, and largest computations are basically being done on language models, such as GPT-3 and so on. And if you look at the, res at the results of such a model like GPT-3, which can basically do, well, close to at least zero-shot learning and so on, where you can actually, by training it on lots and lots of text data, ask many types and more general types of questions, and it will provide answers. This is absolutely fantastic. It's really, really great. It's, uh, I think it's a super capability, and uh, we need to take care of that in a responsible way. Because what is actually happening? Well, of course we haven't necessarily created real intelligence or anything close to that. We have basically, in a sense, at least I subscribe to the idea that we have learned a very efficient representation of a lot of the training data, and we can provide a very, very efficient search function through that to find snippets and construct snippets that uh, correspond to the queries that we put in. But that's quite different from more general AI and true cognition. So what's led to this change? Well, part of it is architectural and perhaps attention is all you need. So when I spoke two years ago, uh, this paper, attention, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, attention is all you need, uh, had, uh, was pretty recent. This has led to a huge shift basically in the field of neural networks. And it's not a big gamble to say that this is something that will take over more and more and more of uh, application domains, not just text, like we've seen already with very big language models, uh, but also within images, within uh, time series data and so on. It's not a bold prediction to say that this is going to encroach on everything. So why is that? Well. Attention is a super efficient way of dealing with long-term and complex dependencies and so on. Finding a way for models to focus in data on what is most important is an absolutely fantastic skill. So architecturally, transformers and attention has changed a lot of the game basically. If we're looking at what we are working on more, not from an architectural perspective, but more of, so where do we apply these things and what is becoming important? We are typically right now looking at 
a few basic things that we need to work with and improve upon to really make these things useful in practice. And a few of the fields that we're looking at are, first of all, of course, representation learning. A lot of what we're doing ha is about representation learning nowadays. But actually, really, the, s the process of from basic data sets, uh, perhaps un unnotated data sets and so on, learn reusable representations. Because we see in practice again and again and again that we typically in specialized applications have very little data and we need to rely on pre-built models. A lot of times we need to build models, like in, for example, healthcare and so on, on certain data sets, for example, from regions or something like that with a certain kind of patients, but we need to move them to a different kind of data set and still make sure that they work. So this is a very non-fancy application of transfer learning, where we're perhaps not moving completely from one domain to another, but we really do need to move knowledge from one one application to a slightly different one. So transfer learning is super important. In many cases, this data is privacy sensitive or sensitive for reasons of um, not wanting to disclose information about the company that produced them and so on. So types of privacy preserving learning is also becoming absolutely essential. And of course, if we go back just to the very large language models and so on, it's very easy to see that just because we've created a model of data, we haven't made a privacy-preserving solution. A lot of these models actually preserve a lot of information about the data set with the right queries. So we need to make sure that we find ways to protect ourselves against this kind of data leakage. And finally, something that we're working on quite a lot, and this is really taken off in the last few months, at least in Sweden, is decentralized and federated approaches to learning. Everyone, it feels like, are now realizing that a lot of times data is super sticky. It cannot be moved to a certain place for privacy reasons, for computational reasons, for communication reasons or something like that. So we need to move learning out to devices or different uh, hospitals or whatever it might be. So development of federated learning is going to be key to success of AI in Sweden. These are practical issues that we can work upon. A lot of them are sort of addressing some of the very fundamental issues within AI and machine learning. I showed this already two years ago in a slightly different form, but Fundamental limits of learning, explainable AI, scalable AI, looking at multimodality, causality, ethical aspects, how to make things robust. These are things that are not going away. These are not issues that we're just going to solve and move on. These are issues that we're going to nudge upon, create better solutions and better, better applications. But we're not, we're not just going to solve them. So if we get back again to the question, has everything changed? Well, in a way it hasn't, because a lot of stuff is uh, very similar to what we were doing a long time ago. But we can address a completely different set of problems nowadays. The tools are way better than they used to be. And there is a lot more knowledge on AI and machine learning compared to just a couple of years ago. And this makes a huge difference when you actually want to build and implement these systems in practice. So in a sense, yeah, we're working on similar problems. We're working with similar methods. But in another way, basically everything that we do has changed. And again, what we're doing when we're applying AI, building new solutions and so on, is basically continuing to expand the environment for practical AI. How can we deploy it in new situations, decentralized, perhaps with privacy uh, limits in safety uh, critical solutions and so on and so on. We are pushing the boundaries step by step for where we can approach and deploy AI. 
So if we go back to this picture a little bit, just a couple of words on some of the things that, uh, uh, in collaboration with others, we are working on. First of all, the privacy issue. And uh, if we look at the privacy issue of distributing data, for example, can we look at data and actually take away sensitive information while preserving, let's say, useful aspects of data? Well, we can try. Generative ad adversarial m networks have become very popular in the last few years, and they can basically be trained to try to, let's say, filter out sensitive aspects of, uh, of uh, for example, in this case, an image. So how do we do that? Well, we basically cre create uh, uh, a network that takes an input image, transforms it, into an image that is difficult to discern whether or not, let's say the sensitive attribute is uh, gender, then is it a man or a woman? This is relatively straightforward to set up for, for a GAN. Now, experience with this shows that, first of all, the, the cost function is relatively important. You could use log likelihood, but it's a little bit better to use entropy and try to make things, let's say, close to the decision boundary so that it really maximizes uncertainty. But most of all, something that we can observe is that it's actually rather useful to put on another generative network on top of this that takes this censored output, but then generates a representative uh, image that picks at random, basically, a gender or something like that, the sensitive attribute, to preserve more of the utility for other applications, while still being unsure, un unsure about what the gender was uh, initially. And if we do that, now it's incredibly difficult to see on this, uh, these plots, basically. But what you can see on the x-axis here is that uh, uh, if you go to the left, you have more uh, you reduce more of the uh, sensitive uh, uh, information. On the y-axis, you have utility. And if you build both of these filters on top and compare it to the baselines that are around today, we can preserve a lot more utility while censoring out sensitive information. Let's look at one of the other areas that we were looking at just a few minutes ago, federated learning. And this also comes back to the fact that federated learning is a relatively, in a sense, uh, immature area. And we haven't addressed a lot of the practical problems. So what do we do with federated learning if we have slight differences between different devices that we want to learn upon and use the models upon? Well, there are lots of different proposals, more or less complicated, but we've decided to take an approach that we feel is one of the most straightforward ones. We, pray, we create one global model, which we basically do by what is typically called federated averaging, by training locally on all of the models, sending uh, these solutions to a central point, averaging out, and then pushing it back out again. But at the same time, we create a local model, and then we create a switching model that looks at input data and switches between the local model or the global model, and we learn both. So what happens? Well, if you have skewed data, now the blue line is on top here with a mixture of expert solution, the green line on the bottom is basic federated averaging, and going to the right in the image, you have more and more skewed solutions, we can provide better solutions because actually the problem becomes easier uh, as data becomes more skewed than federated averaging. And more importantly, we can be relatively sure that we in both uh, situations where we have um, data that is representative from all devices, but also in situations where data actually differs a bit, we can come up with a good solution. Right. 
But these things are relatively small things, right? It's not addressing the greater problem of real changes in capacity of AI. And uh, I talked about this already two years ago, that we know what we can do more or less today in a more general sense. We do very well with pattern recognition and uh, direct function approximation, but perhaps not with cognition. And this is really starting to shine through in the talk about AI and how to use it and so on. Um, this is just an article from Wired at the end of last year where they actually wrote about the fact that AI is sort of pushing the limits of what we can do with the methods that we have right now. And this is still true. We're really pushing the limits of what we can do. And if we do a comparison to biology, what we can do right now is a lot of the basic things that we do in our brain. This is just a, this is a very good picture from a colleague of mine called Martin Nilsson that is just one way of viewing for example, what um, the brain might do. We have a biological substrate. On top of that, we do mostly unsupervised learning. On top of that, we do a little bit of supervised learning. But the difficult boundary to cross is more towards the old AI side. How do we perform step-by-step -step logic and reasoning with true concepts and so on? And today, we can really move from, if we flip the earlier picture flat, today we actually do a lot of these things in practice. We do move from, let's call it an input space to a feature space, typically very often in language or images and so on, some, uh, by, for example, self-supervised learning, where we create a synthetic learning problem to basically build a good representation of data. We can then use it on with relatively little supervised, uh, supervised data to create a good solution but we cannot really move to the complete cognition problem. And that is really something that we should do. That is basically most likely the answer to really create way more powerful transferable AI solutions that really do scale. And I'm not going to go into detail about how to do this, but uh, I do think that we need to take a little bit of inspiration again from biology. And not necessarily just on the neural, ne neural level, but on a little bit of a higher level. So if you do study the brain, you can see that we don't have necessarily these architectures that are extremely big, extremely wide, extremely deep, that only solves one problem. But we have a lot of smaller structures. Basically a lot of multiplexing uh, ensembles that can solve lots of problems at the same time, it gets fed out to an output and then reused and can be iterated and so on. I really do think we need to start looking at these solutions. And by doing that, can perhaps create the missing link, basically. I'm going to skip a couple of slides and jump to one of the other things that I really do think we need to take a little bit care about nowadays, especially a few years into the deep learning revolution. And that is, let's call it care invalidation. This is a paper that was just uh, put out a few weeks ago. I'm not going to comment on exactly what's in that, but just use that as an example of this is an, I uh, this is an issue that is more and more coming up. And I really do think it's a valid one. This paper talks more about the fact that under specification, the fact that a lot of solutions exist to a certain trained model for a certain data set is actually a problem in practice because we really do not know what will generalize well. And what is, solution, what is the solution to this? Well, it's typically better testing and better validation. And a lot of these are restrictions on what we can practically do but also a connection to actual applications. We need to move a little bit beyond just sitting in the lab with training sets, test validation sets and stuff like that and develop what's best. And then reiterating that while building new models and new models and new models on benchmarks and stuff like that, focusing in on very, very specific solutions that might just not generalize that well. So, 
let's talk a little bit about the very broad perspective then about AI. And these are just some things that I've seen during the last couple of years. First of all, we're talking less about machine learning and more about machine reasoning. And this is not to say that I think that we're building real true learning and reasoning system, but we're connecting more and more machine learning to actual action. Basically, or typically, you use machine learning solutions to provide inputs to automated decisions, scheduling, optimization, and so on, creating more of an actual reasoning system. Not rocket science, but a new scope for deployment, basically. We are moving on from bolt-on AI to integrated AI, at least we're talking way more about it. Instead of just, let's say, uh, doing the traditional data science, find some data, build a machine learning solution, test it, build a prototype and so on, actually ask the question, so what do we need to build a new service? What components do we need? What need, kind of data do we need to collect? And how do we build this complete system? This change from a, let's call it a data science perspective to an AI perspective, I think is absolutely great. And it's fantastic that we're seeing more and more of it. This also means that a lot of different things become more important. We have been talking a lot about data and technologies before. Now, also as a technologist myself, I find myself talking way more about strategy, mindsets, organizations, and how to change them and so on. And this is often the most important thing to actually get AI out there. And it's important to get AI out there because we see that if we start to use it in public sector, in companies and so on, when we build new infrastructures, when we build new models and learn more about it, basically, in many cases, AI adoption within these organizations improve almost exponentially. We are faster and faster in building data pipelines, model pipelines. We build more and more applications and everything accelerates, basically. So it's really important to try and work with AI on an integrated level. So let's spend the last few minutes on connecting some of these things to what we are doing with building strategies for AI in Sweden. So what we see right now is that we do have large basic research programs like VASP and so on. We do have lots of investment in, uh, in uh, private sector typically, but we have relatively still few people and few groups excelling. The general knowledge is relatively low which means that it's difficult for people to get started and sometimes they're basically almost afraid to get started with AI. We see that there are relatively few applied AI research groups and in many cases AI focused SMEs and startups and so on need to a little bit to take their place and we're really limited by the fact that we, there isn't that much knowledge of AI in politics and public discussion and so on and so on. So what we see needs to be done to get AI out there, to accelerate AI in Sweden, is again, we need to come together. We have very limited resources. We have scattered resources. We need to make sure that all of these ones collaborate together. So what we at AI in Sweden are doing right now is to create these arenas for collaboration with academia, industry, public sector partners and so on. And we do that in two different parts, so to speak. We talk about strategic research and innovation areas and we talk about major impact initiatives. Let's go through a little bit about what, we're, what we mean by that. But first of all, what are the key issues for getting AI out there? Well. We at AI Sweden talk about basically industrialization and operationalization of AI. It might not sound super, super exciting talking about industrialization, but it's really a matter of taking these kinds of methods that we've been developing and using for a very long time, make them robust enough, fast enough to develop and good enough to be able to maintain over a long time to be used in practice. So. We define a number of actual research and strategic areas where we can collaborate 
that are key, solving key issues for a lot of players in Sweden, and potentially also contribute a little bit to the Swedish AI independence so that we're not too reliant on other, uh, other countries and ecosystems and so on. And of course, we can see a few of these areas come back. As we talked about before, decentralized AI is being absolutely key to developing AI within Sweden. We're now building a strategic program for the next few years that will start to address this with lots of partners. We are hoping that this will grow. We see that reusable models for Sweden, such as more specifically Swedish language models that can be used again and again and that does not have to be trained by every organization that needs to use a Swedish language model is really important for accelerating AI. So we're building that as well in a strategic program. We know that being able to create robust models that we can rely upon in cars, in healthcare and so on is super important. So we're building platforms around that and privacy preserving solutions and so on. So we can actually pick up the major trends, some fundamentals for developing AI and translate them to areas where lots of companies, public sector, academia can collaborate in Sweden and build solutions. And finally, let's talk a little bit about what we call major impact initiatives. So a lot of these strategic programs and so on come from solving key issues for a lot of players, but they might not necessarily create the kind of inspiration and motivation of higher level goals that you might see to actually collaborate again around something. And we see the need for that. We need to collect people around higher goals. People want that, people need that. And we're not done with finding our Swedish moonshot projects, what we should build the next 10 years and put lots and lots of effort in. But we know that industry, public sector are willing to contribute to them, are willing to collaborate against them. And a lot of ideas circulate around healthcare. And we're running some projects already around information driven healthcare. And uh, then we can try to build the new smart healthcare system of the future. And a lot of things around climate change, media and AI and democracy, but also mobility and logistics. And uh, with that, I would also just like to connect to the final point. If we look at major impact initiatives, one of the things that we're really missing in Sweden is a debate of how we want to use AI. What do we want to use AI for? Because when it comes to AI and ethics, when it comes to building larger systems, for example, AI in healthcare or transportation, we need to know where we're going. What are we building things for? Do we want to optimize for as much and easy transportation as possible? Or do we want to minimize carbon dioxide emissions? Do we want to provide healthcare for everyone? Or do we want to provide the best solution to very specific cases? We need to make these decisions and we need to have a debate about them in Sweden. And if we all of us working on AI can contribute to, the, to this debate, I think it would be a very, very good push for deploying AI in the future. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, so let's take the last minutes for a couple of questions. Absolutely. Cool. So <clears throat> uh, for your last point in terms yes. of what we should actually do with AI, do you think that's a partly political issue? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, it's <laughs> okay. a political issue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because we need to... Uh, I didn't actually read the quote on the almost last slide there, but I actually kind of like it. It's, um, it's a quote from Norbert Wiener that basically says that it doesn't matter what kind of machines we build, if it's of bureaucracy and flesh and uh, organizations, or if it's uh, metal and electrons and, uh, and machines, we need to decide what these machines, so to speak, are for and what they should aim for 
in their decisions and when they're building um, uh, their their business, so to speak. And these questions don't change necessarily if it's AI or if it's people making the decisions and so on. So on a larger scale, a lot of uh, a lot of deployment decisions, again, within democracy, healthcare and mobility and so on, boils down to political decisions. Mm. And we need to have a political debate about mm. them, ah. unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as engineers, we're not yeah, that I mean, it would be easier. with that. Yeah, it would yeah. be easier to get around the problem, but <laughs> right. we don't really. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we have a lot of questions now. I'll yep. start with some of them. So you mentioned, I mean, I know that Re Rice is using the concept of data readiness. Yes. Uh, so is that really a prerequisite for applying machine learning? Could companies out there sort of leapfrog data readiness and be able to use machine learning anyway? Yeah, if they're lucky. If but they're <laughs> <laughs> I think using the concept of data readiness is more, uh, more of a guide and a checklist to make sure that you can actually get through these steps to be in a better position to deliver good results, basically. Uh, uh, I think it's really, really good to spell these things out. Things that practitioners like us have had in the back of our heads for a very, very long time, basically, but are not necessarily put into practice and best practices and so on. So I think it's a very, very good idea to use data readiness. But should, should companies, I mean, do this data lake building or uh, advanced analytics? Uh, or? Yeah, that, that's a different, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've seen a lot of data swamps. Mm where data just coll are collected and rot mm. for uh, mm. ages. So I know uh, that's true. I, I really do believe in uh, sometimes just collecting data and saying that we're going to build solutions later. It's just uh, organizations being, uh, um, let's call it scared of actually uh, trying to answer the difficult questions. What are we going to use it for? And what is the actual Mm -hmm. uh, solutions that we want to build. And I always want to start with, so what are we going to build? What do we need? And then you can spread out to what data do yeah. we need? What data do we have? What data do we need to collect? And so on. Uh, yeah, I think that's an important point. So you don't yes. end up in this big data lake project. Exactly. So, uh, that yeah. leads nowhere with yeah. perhaps not the data that was useful anyway, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we have a question from uh, Jesper here, mm -hmm. and he's mentioning that uh, isn't GPT a GPT-3, the kind of example of a model that is not specialized on one thing. I think you mentioned Yes. Yeah. In a sense, yes. It's, uh, it's not specialized on one thing, but it's relatively difficult to move GPT-3 to, to control the factory. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, not what it does. It no. can't drive a car. Right. Uh, it can't, you know, answer a certain type of legal questions and stuff like that, even though it's seen a lot of text. So, mm -hmm. in a sense, it's... I would still argue that we should call it narrow AI and narrow okay. machine learning. Yeah. yeah. No, and I mean, uh, I don't <laughs> there are not many people out there yeah. <laughs> having a different view, I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we have a little bit of a Friday out there question now yeah. from uh, Jacob. Sure. So do you think graph neural networks and connected data will be important in advancing reasoning capabilities of AI? Yes, I actually do think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Why? I do think so. Because so much data that we also already have is being structured in that way. And I would really, really like to connect uh, the things that we're doing today with structured knowledge, knowledge graphs, and that kind of thing, because it's so much quicker learning process, right? If you don't have to, you know, if you can learn relations and things like that, it's a way quicker way than just, if we go back to GPT-3 again, just predict predicting the next word is good and well, but if you have the knowledge that uh, Barack Obama is married to Michelle Obama, then let's state that directly, mm -hmm. basically. So okay. I think that's a very strong learning signal. And there are so many other uses for graph neural networks. So yes, right. I think it's super important. Right. But it also seems like yeah, the field is not actively researched in the way, that or sufficiently researched. No, I don't think so. There are lots of, I think there are lots of subfields in, in machine learning and AI today that are not <laughs> researched well enough, basically, mm -hmm. uh, which is unfortunate because a lot of these fields are the ones that can potentially provide in, in, at a later stage this kind of, let's call it, um, not quite a quantum leap, but at least a leap in capabilities, basically. Okay. Yeah. So we have a final question, yep. and that is from Jesper. Mm -hmm. uh, so where do you see Gaia, the organization that organizes the conference, in the landscape of AI Sweden? 
Oh, I would. Ver oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, in the organization AI Sweden or in, within AI in Sweden? Uh, in the, in the organization yeah. AI Sweden. Yeah. So I think that Gaia, Gaia should be an active part mm -hmm. of, uh, of AI Sweden because uh, this kind of network with so many practitioners and so much actual knowledge mm. is absolutely <laughs> crucial to build AI in Sweden in the future yeah. because there's, there's a lot of interest, but it sometimes does not connect to actual AI and machine learning and data science expertise. And I think, uh, I think Gaia is a perfect network that really should be part of AI yeah. Sweden yeah. and we could leverage each other, basically. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah. And I think there's a big disconnect between actually, I mean, people talking about AI and yes. us out there actually building exactly. and so on. Exactly. So let's, let's hope Which that AI Sweden can be the bridge between them. I hope so. I okay. hope so. Let's okay. see. It's a huge challenge. But <laughs> yeah, I hope definitely. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Anna, welcome up with flowers. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. So <coughs> we have uh, more questions on the list and perhaps we'll send them over email and yeah, see sure. if you can. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Thank cool. you so Thank much. Thank you so much.